and welcome to the Teaching with Class podcast, the podcast that gives you quick, actionable tips to easily implement in your classrooms. I'm your host, Monica Pujol-Nasif. In today's episode, we'll be discussing class and special education. And with me is Mary Margaret Garner. I couldn't be more excited and proud and Mary Margaret is the classiest person I know. <laughs> when I started my journey with class back in 2011, 2012, Mary Margaret used to come to the organization I was working with. And when we talk, I don't even know how many times she came to us, but every time I saw her name, I needed to go to those trainings. Every time I went to a conference and she was there, sometimes I even paid extra money to go listen to Mary Margaret. Oh I just gosh. wanted to listen to her. <laughs> she is all class, anything that we need to know about class. She is one of the first persons who started disseminating the message of class, the magic of class. So having you here, Mary Margaret, is such an honor. I love you so much and I'm Aww. so excited. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's been a long time since we've been face to face. So I guess this is the best we can do. And I'm thrilled to be here talking with you, Monica. <laughs> and so, I can't believe it's been that long. I don't want to do the math. <laughs> well, that's when I started. You started like many years before me. So tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Well, let's see. I started out in the field of education in 1976. Please don't do the math. I um, graduated from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and I majored in child development and family relationships, and I also majored in psychology. And I thought I wanted to be a play therapist, and I did a practicum in a hospital working with terminally ill children. I realized that was absolutely not what I wanted to do because I I was not strong enough. And as I was working my way through school, I worked in a child care center and it was a chain that's no longer working. I mean, it's not there anymore, but I was the after school teacher and I had 24 school age children by myself and we were only allowed to be outside because the director was a single mom and she had her kids there. And she realized that her paycheck was based on the profitability of the center. So as a result, she figured out that we would never use any equipment or materials. And that way the profit was better. And I was thinking, well, this is, a, this is terrible. I, I need to fix this. <laughs> so I started working in childcare <laughs> and I've been working on fixing what I thought was terrible for a lot of years. So then I became a, a teacher, director, area director, built and designed hospital centers, um, and then in 92, I moved back to Virginia, which is where I'm from, and uh, started working for a nonprofit, which is when I was introduced to the class um, when we were doing the quality rating improvement system in the state of Virginia. Um, and I was one of the first uh, rater mentors, uh, trainers for a class and another environmental tool in the state of Virginia, but was really introduced to the class in 2007 and started working for Teachstone in 2010 and worked for Teachstone until uh, the winter of 2020. And the pandemic came and I thought, well, I'm gonna retire. And then I was like, oh, but there's nothing to do. So now I still <laughs> do consulting for Teachstone. <laughs> and, um, so anyway, and I, I am a, a huge fan of this tool because I've seen it literally change teachers and children's lives. So I guess I'm a geek, but anyway. <laughs> That's all it's I can good. tell you. <laughs> it's good to be a geek. And thank you for that story. That is your inspiration came from a bad experience, but you have made it such a strong career for yourself, but for all the people that you touch. I'm telling you, I'm going to say it again, you touched my life. Huh. And I said, I'm going to work my entire life to be like Mary Margaret. <laughs> so we are here today. She's gifting us with her expertise in the field of special education. So we're gonna marry and talk about class second edition and teachers who work with children with special needs who have been approaching us with questions, what do we do when this happens? Mm -hmm. And at the end, we're also gonna talk about uh, if you're an observer, what do we do as observers to make sure that we are doing it um, as we want to do it for the children. So on class second edition, we have developed these guiding principles of effective interactions that will support both educators and observers. The first one is honor individual variations and ways of being. 
And the second one is individualized interactions to support each child's unique learning. So as you hear these principles, we Im immediately see how they apply to all children. Absolutely. And children with special, well, I've, you know, every child has special needs. Mm -hmm. Every child has a way of communicating what they need from us. And every interaction has an outcome. And so one of the things I think that gives me hope and as we're supporting educators is hopefully to give you hope is just, it's really that personal relationship where you really understand that child and how they're trying to communicate that is going to drive the context of all those interactions and make them valuable. So whether you're trying to help them learn to organize their toys or if, you know, if they're trying to do some sort of sequencing or something, or you're just trying to help them be able to sit and choose a song during morning circle, whatever it is, knowing that child really well and really being cued in to whatever, whatever signals in, uh, that they're giving you of what they need, that is the key to, I think, really powerful and strong interactions. And so as a coder, and I've done a fair amount of coding in the last, I don't even want to say how many years, <laughs> I'm not looking for perfection. I'm looking to see what is that child asking for and how is that teacher responding in a way that's working for that child? And so that dimension of educator sensitivity is one that is particularly important when we're talking about children with special needs, really understanding the way they communicate and what they're asking from us so that we can tailor make our response. And so that whole thing about every child getting their, you know, individual needs met, that's hard to do. Nobody's going to be perfect all the time, but they give you so many chances to try to respond in a way that works for them, right? And so I see this as a uh, limitless options to really connect with kids and help them figure out how to navigate classrooms and life and rules. And I love how you said things. Th they give the teachers endless opportunities. That is so true. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the teachers have, uh, and right, that's the message. And we, we go out there and we talk about it. And then they come back with questions like this one teacher said to me, I have a child with autism and he does not like to interact. How can I be effective in my interactions with him? What would you say to this teacher? Well, every child on the spectrum has different ways of needing communication, right? And so you don't have to be at them all the time. You don't have to be teaching them or learning them. You want to be reading them and seeing what it is that that child's ready to do in that particular context. I worked, so when I was working for this nonprofit, when there was no money for grants, I worked as a special ed aide in my daughter's elementary school. And I had this one little fellow, I'll just call him Jay. He was four years old and he was on medication for violent and aggressive behavior. And he was violent and aggressive to the point where he would look at you, go find uh, scissors or something to throw. And you could see him gauging whether he wanted to throw it at your face or your body. He was very, he, but he was uh, echelay, like he had no language of his own. And so he, I was his shadow and uh, he didn't know how to interact with anyone. And so he would basically walk up and punch somebody in the face. And I, I watched that for a while and I'm like, he's not, upset with that child, he doesn't know how to come into a, into a play situation. And so we worked on just saying, hi, hi, right? And, and we worked on a lot of things, but that just getting him to the point where he saw me as a support, as somebody who was going to help him enter a group of, he was a typical four-year-old, well, not typical, but atypical, but he's wanted to have friendships, right? And so he didn't know how to do that. And instead of getting in trouble for that and being sent to the office or whatever it was, I'm like, this child doesn't understand how to walk into a situation. Let's figure out a way to help him walk into the situation. It took a lot of me doing it and the children learning to do that and little by little, and then lots and lots of specific acknowledgement of when he was doing the right thing. And he, he became a friend to some of those children, you know, it, it, but it was a, it was a powerful experience. So don't feel like you have to make them force them to interact. If they're not ready for that, look for the more subtle cues, you know, uh, look for what they're doing and maybe use noticing language like that observer is going to be looking at that child that doesn't want to interact. And how is that teacher maybe just being physically nearby just as a source to hold presence with that child, hold space with that child and build that 
rapport. It's just, am I reading that that child doesn't want to be interacted? Is the teacher overstimulating, understimulating? Is it just the slightest nuance of noticing that they might want to be looking at a particular puzzle or something and just sliding it over? You know, that's a beautiful evidence of uh, awareness and responsiveness and meeting that child's needs. Wow. Observation. Like as teachers, we are scientists by we observing are. and really figuring things out intentionally. Mm -hmm. And you just said it, it's not an easy task. We, right, this is something we highlight every time we are together in the podcast. It takes a, a long time sometimes, but it's about reading as a teacher, getting to know the child, and observers are looking for not only to that child, but how is this child being attended to when it's necessary, right? You just said it is not being on the face of the child all the time. It's just when they need it. Mm -hmm. And so then they gradually need more, right? Maybe. <laughs> one more too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that brings me to, to another situation when also they, they mentioned this, this specific organization just started doing inclusion in, within the classrooms. So teachers are kind of scared. This is brand new to them. And so they said, so these children come and they have behaviors that I don't understand. They don't want to talk, like zero speak, or they throw themselves on the, on the floor. And so their fear is, how do I attend individually to those children who need me in the moment, but also the other children who don't have special needs and they're in the classroom and they also need me. Right. And one of the things that I found really helpful is when a child is, is having a, an issue falling down or having a dysregulated moment. It's frightening to the other children. It's also frightening to the child that it's happening to because they're just, they're out of resources. And it's frightening for the teacher because you don't know what to do. One thing I would do is like, make sure I position myself in a place where I can see everybody and even talk through what I think that child might be feeling. So I'm going to say your name, Monica, because you're not dysregulated. I'll say, Monica's really upset. And um, I can see that you would really like to be able to go into the block center and the block center's full. And your feelings are really strong right now. You're having really big feelings. Let's think of ways we can help Monica. So talking through so that the other children hear that is going to be a very sensitive moment and a very highly, uh, in terms of regard for child perspectives, right? That giving that somebody else's perspective by articulating it for that child. Um, and I'm talking about someone that, you know, a child that maybe can't verbalize or just acting out. It's just, I mean, <laughs> I have a two-year-old granddaughter who she has a lot of emotions. <laughs> and uh, when we've taught her to do a deep breath when she's having big feelings, but allowing the feelings, allowing in, in giving them the pathway to get to the other side of that is your primary responsibility. It, it is rocket science. It is reading that situation in the moment and, but, but also having goals for where you want them to go. Um, and just learn as much about child development as you can. And then you'll understand where children are off path, but every child has their own story. They have their attachment style. They have their temperament. They have their experiences in and out of the classroom. So all of that impacts who they are and doing some research, you know, getting to know the families, all of that is so important. And then having a game plan with your, your, your coworkers about what I'm like, okay, I'm going to be walking over here now. And like, I can see this is happening. So I'm going to be going over to sit with Monica, you know, letting people know what was going on. It's a little bit of a funny, I like humor, you know, <laughs> when this child would throw things, we would try not to react because he really liked the, this projectile. <laughs> we would just say, incoming, we'd all duck. <laughs> but we would just say it with the flattest. <laughs> that's, you know, you got that's working with your coworkers. Sometimes it, you need humor, especially in the field of early care and education, but having that communication and talking about what you're doing, you know, not only does that let everybody know what's going on, but it also impacts language development too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you also mentioned that regard for child perspective, right? That theory of mind when the children can understand where others are coming from or what they believe or what they like through that teachers saying it. Mm -hmm. 
So talking about that, what would you say to the teachers that they can do when a child is having difficulties regulating their level of arousal? Take a breath. Try to look to see what might be precipitating that. And sometimes in the moment, that's hard to do, especially if somebody's in physical danger, right? A child or another child. But take a moment, take a breath to regulate yourself. It's a very high stress when you have a child that's in high stress and your heartbeat starts going and just, just taking a breath and saying, in this moment, what is that child asking for? Because it's attention seeking. If every behavior has, has goal. It's not always so clear. Another thing that is helpful, and this is not just in the moment, right? But to sit down and write down the things that are happening that are difficult for that child. So you know, hard to hang up their backpack or transition to washing hands or whatever it is. Picking those things and then what are the behaviors associated with that? And then track those behaviors over time because you're going to see patterns. You're going to see patterns of behavior. You're going to see connections to the triggers for that and what's what's the outcome when the child exhibits that particular behavior. So be a researcher, be a scientist, jot these things down as specifically as possible. And with this one child, we had 15 different behaviors that we tracked for, uh, well, they were like 11 to three. And, and I had all the behaviors that like in 15 minute increments. And at the beginning of the year, when I started working, we had 160, 170 hash marks. And by the end of the year, we would sometimes have three or four. And it was, but it was very intentional on our part on how we scaffolded slowly getting him to understand what to do. And also reading his cues, you know, like he would start to jump and I knew, okay, I need to go stand next to him, you know, but it was very subtle. You wouldn't, you would just think normally, oh, he's just hyper or whatever, like take the label off a child and just look to that heart within to see if you can meet that need. So that's what I would tell those teachers. <laughs> it's so impactful to hear almost 200 check marks in the beginning to maybe three or four through intentional uh, interaction and understanding their behaviors. And teachers out there, you're, you're hearing this. Mary Margaret was a teacher in the classroom. This is real. Yeah, it was uh, very real. <laughs> <laughs> and again, she said it. it wasn't easy, but it was, they did it. And just imagine the life of that child because of all this intentionality. He's probably like 20 now, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned if you, once you get to another challenge, you can scaffold from that moment. So let's talk a little bit about uh, another concern from teachers who have children with any kind of disability or developmental delay when they say, What kind of interactions will support the cognitive and language development when they're having these challenges, the children are having challenges? So developmentally or chronologically, they might be five years old or three years old or however, but developmentally, they're not there yet. And so you want to kind of back up to the critical periods of child development to try to figure out where the holes are. And what all children want is safety, security, and a sense of belonging. And so stepping back and finding a way to to get to the bottom of Maslow's triangle, it might be what you need to do before you try to work on the language development or the cognitive development, but they're still putting pieces together. Their schema might look simpler than some children, you know, but just looking to see what what their interest is. Are they uh, big fine motor kids or large motor kids? You know, is music helpful? Like you're, you're trying all these different, strategies, that scaffolding is like taking that child from where they are and trying to add supports to get them to the next level. It doesn't always work, but you're putting it in there, right? So, or describing what you see happening or adjusting what you're doing. So talking all the time, all that narration about what's going on, that's all going in their receptive language. All the children are getting that. It's maybe even more like a toddler or an infant in terms of hearing so much language and making those neural connections, that might be something that is going to be helpful for them hearing the words, hearing you explain what's going on, hearing you identify their feelings. They don't know what their feelings are. So a lot of that active listening, if you remember that concept, you know, where you're really describing what you think they're feeling. And sometimes you get it wrong, but at least you're validating the fact that they're struggling. And so what does language modeling look like for a child with no language, 
is going to be very different than language modeling for a child that is very articulate. What you're trying to do is teach them, help them understand that language is a form of communication and that in whatever level, whatever format, they're a valued conversational partner, whether it's a gesture, a one word sentence or a diatribe. <laughs> you are, we want them to know that their voice is important. Their sound is important. Their communication is important. So in terms of language modeling, if I'm coding a classroom and a teacher is uh, using uh, social stories or a, a, a calendar, a, a a schedule with pictures on it and talking about that and talking through that and having the child come over and touch something or picking, uh, you know, the, sometimes you'll have like the songs they're going to sing and let children like touch the, you know, three blind mice or whatever, um, like pick that and then describe what they're doing. All of that is language going in. All of that is considered language modeling. All of that is considered a conversation. The child doesn't have to converse back. Yes, it's great. We're moving towards articulation and more complex, but they don't have to. We're doing those strategies to do that. And the same with, um, you know, the metacognition and trying to figure out how to learn. Experimentation, allow children to play with ideas, allow children to wonder and ponder. And they may not be able to verbally do that, but by providing materials and thoughtful guiding questions, it, a concept is not a thing. It's an idea. And so where, what idea do you see forming in that mind? Like what, how do they show you their understanding of whatever it is that they're trying to do, instructional support or whatever, and then add to that as best you can. Thank you. As a coder, I would love that. I mean, I would be all over writing about that. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's move on to the coders, but just highlighting here, whether children are verbal or non-verbal, teachers are verbal. And if they're exposing the children to the language, one or, way or the other, it depends where they are in their um, developmental phase, it's helping that child, but it's helping everybody else. Exactly. Around. It is. Okay. So let, let's talk about observers. <laughs> yeah. So do observers need to know about special needs when they go observe a classroom with we can't know specifically about the individual children. Okay. That's, that, they have IEPs. That's not okay. But you can say, how many children have special needs? Are there any special supports or things that you do? What are they working on? What are they like? Are you working on them being able to walk up and say hello? <laughs> like those kind of things that knowing that about the class and also knowing the schedule, the daily schedule, so that you know when it's going to be an appropriate time to observe or not. But, you know, if the, if the educator is trying to share how Mary Margaret does this, that, and just say, I'm just here to, you know, observe. I don't need to know. Thank you very much. But let's, I'm just going to be looking at behaviors. That can be really helpful. And just sitting when you first get to a site, just sitting there for a minute and kind of getting the flow and kind of seeing how things run and who, you know, which adults are there. Sometimes they're um, support services people, you know, and you have to make a decision based on the protocol for whoever you're observing for. Do you look at those special, the extra people or do you not? Are they doing services in the classroom or are they being taken out? All those things are things that you're going to need to know about as, so that you can get really good quality data. And then again, make no interpretation about what you're seeing until you're done with the cycle. Nothing, it, it, it means nothing until you have 20 minutes of data. And so watch yourself that you're not saying, oh, that's really rough, or I wouldn't have done that, or, or that was great. Like, whatever, you've got to put that aside. And that's one of the hardest things about being a good observer is just putting that stuff out of the way. But recognize that what we're looking for are patterns of strength and patterns of challenge. And that's what we collect the data for. So if here's an example of this one class I worked with. This is a different uh, class. I had seven kids and five of them were on the spectrum. And they would come to, to on the bus. It was the second part of the day, you know, half day program. They would get off the bus. They would walk down to their classroom where the morning class was still there, put their backpacks down, then walk back down the hall to the cafeteria, which was full of all the children in the elementary school go through the lunch line, sit down at the table, eat their lunch, and then go back down the hall and go into their classroom. So how many, I don't even know how many transitions that was, but they, it wasn't, it was not going well. 
it was just not going well. <laughs> and so I was like, how about we take them on the playground when they get here and then have lunch in the room when the other children have left? Changed everything. Ta-da! But if I'm in there and I'm looking in there, I'm in this cafeteria and these kids, like, they were running out the room and screaming and throwing things. And I mean, they were just, it was too much, right? It was too loud, too, too much and too many transitions. And I'm watching that as a coder. I'm, I'm not saying, well, this is what they should do. I'm just saying, I'm seeing five transitions here. As a coach, I'm going to say, let's figure out a way to work on that. It wasn't the teacher's fault that they were having those transitions. That was an administrative oversight, right? And so class data is going to help you understand where those struggles are. And if your children are melting down, that's good information. It's okay to see the meltdowns. Nobody's going to ding you because your children are having trouble dis no, being dysregulated in, in how you respond to that and the sensitivity and the responsiveness and the, and helping those children get back in the flow of interactions. That's what we look for as a coder. So if you catch yourself having bias, and we all do, we all do, jot it down. Like on your, on a sticky note, on your scoring booklet, just say, mm, wow, or wow, that was great, or whatever it is. And then when you're done with your cycle and you're actually beginning to make a decision about what to code each dimension, look at that to see, get your feeling out. And nine times out of 10, it's an observable behavior, but it might not go where you think it does. But when you write it down and you put it aside, it's out of your head and you can come back to it and decide where it fits. Yeah. When you are talking, I'm remembering those moments when I became an observant learning that, like writing mm -hmm. it on the side and sometimes you just throw it away. Yep. Because it's not part of the observation. <laughs> but it's not stuck in your head anymore. Right? Because you one moment, shining or not shining moment, can really impact the quality of the observation. And so that is just making sure that you're really following the true protocol and looking at those descriptions so that you find the one that most closely resembles what you see. This is not a punitive tool. It is built it was built for professional development and to really fine tune individualized, or you could do it, you know, for a grantee or a classroom or a group of teachers or whatever. But that's the beauty of this tool is that you can find the strength. You can find the challenges and let's see, pick out the strength and say, can we do more of that during small group? Yes. Tiny little bits. It's tiny little tiny bits. But we have to have that big picture and we have to have good, accurate data so we don't make excuses. We just, we need the information. In order for like when I was talking about that little boy and all the hash marks and everything, or the kids that were making all those transitions. If we hadn't really looked at the situation, that, that behavior wouldn't have stopped and it might have escalated. Okay, so as observer, which tool do they choose? Good question. There's, you know, an age level, uh, infant, toddlers, yeah, pre-K above. And I, that's a conversation that you would probably have to make or have with the people that, for whatever the, whoever you're observing for, they, that protocol needs to be in place. Sometimes, with, especially if they're self-contained classrooms, you might want to step down to toddler. But to make sure that you're using that same tool if you go back in at the end of the year. But honestly, the pre-K... It it's, works as well, right? All children need to be feel connected. All children need to be free from fear of physical or emotional harm. All children need to be valued. All children need to be feel it's safe, right? All children deserve to have uh, an organized classroom so there's lots of time to interact. And all children are capable of moving maybe large steps, maybe small steps down the learning how to learn. That's what instructional support is at metacognition, all children are there. So even the older age levels are going to take that into account. And so again, you might want to step it down, especially if there's not a lot of verbal skills in that classroom. But again, if you really look at the heart and the meaning and the, the true focus of language modeling or regard or whatever it is, it's human interactions. It's human nature. It's going to capture it. So it does, we don't have to go to a lower level. You said maybe if it's a contained classroom, maybe. Mm -hmm. 
But at the end of the day, they all deserve the same kind of quality interactions Mm -hmm. and we have the same needs. And so even using the pre-K with children with special needs. So every interaction, right? An interaction is an exchange, right? So you say something, I say something, whatever. And there's an outcome to that interaction. And what we want with the class tool is to have as many uh, effective outcomes, feeling safe, connected, all of that as possible. And so it's like this drop in the bucket, right? So what we're, what we're trying to do is increase the effectiveness of those interactions over time, but you have so many chances to interact, right? So just focusing on what those domains are telling us to look for can simplify your approach. Connection, time to connect, and thinking. And so we can definitely organize our thinking like that and, and, and step away from having to... There, you don't do class behaviors. You just interact. <laughs> That's all it is. And so we're trying to see patterns of that and how to, to support teachers in that. And so each child is going to com- communicate in their own way. And that's the beauty of this is a, how do we respond to that? Well, I feel like I could keep you forever with me. <laughs> <laughs> but let's start closing up with please gift our audience with two or three strategies you want them to live with today. Get to know your children. Give yourself grace because that does not happen easily. Focus on what they're communicating and what they're, what they're asking for. So one way that you would do that was just jot down the names of all the children in your class. Just paying close attention to the ones that you forget. Those are the children that are probably not asking in as obvious way. And make sure that and you can check your roster, right? You have a lot of kids. And then just jot down three things you know about each child. And three things that you'd like to know more about for each child. And that's how you build your, your goals for behavior. That's how you decide what they need. Do that prep work, you know, and, and you might have to debrief at the end of the day or at the end of the week. Um, those strategies are really helpful. Or have sticky notes all around the room. And when you notice that somebody actually walked up into a, a group of children and, and entered the play without any conflict, quickly write down, you know, 11, 10, 23, uh, 10 a.m. I'm sorry, 11, 10, 23 at 10 a.m. circle time, answer a question or whatever it is. And just all those little sticky notes. And then you can look at those over time. It helps you with teacher conferences. It helps you with planning. It's a quick and easy little uh, way to keep track of what's going on because in the moment it's, it's too much. If you sit back and try to reflect at the end of a busy day, it's not going to be there, but a quick little hand, like little handwritten oh. note, just stick it somewhere, have sticky notes and pens everywhere that where the kids can't get them <laughs> necessarily. And uh, <laughs> just follow that over the day. And again, just give yourself grace and look to them as humans. Every one of those children is somebody's baby. Right. And so treat them like you want your baby to be treated or how you would have been wanted to be treated when you were a young child. If you can be that person, you can change lives. Thank you, Mary Margaret. (laughs) And I just want to say, observe your children, document. So observing is good, but on top of that, document it on the spot. Yeah. So we should mention too, I think Allison's yeah. going to add it into the podcast at some point, but we have some great resources on the Teach Done website. If you just type in special needs, there's uh, quite a few, like it's like a course and there's even videos to support you can download. So I highly recommend you go and take a look at that and also learn as much as you can about child development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a million times for <laughs> sharing your expertise with us today. And again, we could keep you forever and you can talk about anything, but thank you for today. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Inspiring our teachers uh, who are working with children with developmental delays or special needs who say, I don't, I just don't know, I need one little thing. And hopefully you guys are bringing that with you. So, you know, you can find today's episode and the transcript on our website at teachstone.com slash podcasts. And thank you, Architects of the Brain for sharing your love and wisdom with the children of the world and for being here to add to your box of wonders. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.